Hello everyone, I hope everyone is doing fine. Um, this is the, um, the YouTube that I was telling you about, the second one. There was three things as far as how, um, there's a light on in here. I just have to turn it off real quick. One second. Um, what I was telling you, yeah, we got it. Um, there was three, there was three YouTubes that, um, I was supposed to do, I did the first one on how Jehovah's Witnesses are taught racist, um, tactics. It's hard to say, but I, it's really true. Um, I did one on the Christianity. Now, this one is going to be on ex-Jehovah Witnesses, how they prejudice, how they prejudice, um, ex-Jehovah Witnesses. Okay? The tactics that they use. Now... I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you, um, I have three points that I have to bring out as far as the, um, uh, how can I say humiliate, I'm not humiliating, I'm going to say by making up terms and really false things about the person that they're being prejudiced about, okay, um, the people that they're being prejudiced about, but I can say the person because everybody is an individual, the second one I'm going to bring out is about um, hard, I mean like, how can I say, can I say hardcore? Just something just, I, I didn't have hardcore before, but um, there was another term that I used. But how your safety, they don't even care about um, what might happen to you. That's the second part. I explain it like that. It wasn't hardcore. It was another word. If I come up with it, I'm going to use it. And the third part I'm going to talk about is the, um, uh, is it the, um, to not talking to you. I mean, uh, they use, um, shunning, but I, it's, I, I broke these things down to say that they don't talk to you. Okay. Um, as a human being. You, you, I mean, you'll see once I get to that point. So the first one that I, I wanted to talk on was, um, the first one is about, um, uh, let me see, not how they talk about, what was the first point that I just said that I'm going to do? Um, it's the name calling. Okay. Now, I mean, the reason why it was hard for me to figure it out because I have to put up the whole thing, something that happened to me, and then I have to put up um, what happened to me in their organization. So it will show you that it is a tactic, okay? A very bad tactic, okay? And before I say that, I want to say that the people themselves probably don't understand what they're doing because the most dangerous thing that you can do is um, get someone who doesn't know at all what they're doing and teach them the wrong way to hurt other people, okay? That's very, the most dangerous thing because, I mean, they have no knowledge. You get certain people to just do something that they are ignorant to, okay? Which is a very, very sad thing. Now, getting back to, um, so that's what I'm saying about the Jehovah Witnesses and like my family, I can't really, I know where it's coming from. And the examples that I'm giving you also, I'm not blaming so much the people because that's the way that they were taught. You know, that's the sad thing. So the first one that I have is when I lived in New York City, I worked in the Irish pub, okay? And um, my room was right outside, I mean, was above the pub, and I lived above the pub, and I could, and it was facing the street, so I could hear, and plus when it's hot, I don't think I had air conditioning in there, because I would leave the windows open. And all the time, not all the time, but several times, a lot of times, I would have these certain people saying the n-word and they know they were saying it to me okay because i was like the only 
person of color in that area. And they would just say, that, but like, um, but as a Jehovah Witness and as a person who's gone through that so much, it just doesn't really, you just get something like callous to it. Okay. So anyway, it didn't mess with me going to work every morning because I worked downstairs and I worked and I, plus I was going to school. So that's one thing. So how can I um, show you an example of it in the um, Jehovah Witness organization? Well, when I left the organization, I was called, I would have been called, will have, would have been called an evil slave class, which is very not a good term, okay? And not because of that, because you actually have friends in the organization. And this is one thing that we don't even think about as Jehovah Witnesses. We just, we basically just take it out of our mind, but it, it does hurt to the core when you know that all of your friends are going to listen to you, them saying that you're no longer part of the organization and you cannot talk to them and they're like evil slave class it comes up and now they call apostates and that's where it really hurts but it hurts so bad some and a lot of people don't realize and i know a lot of ex jehovah witnesses don't realize that they put it in the back of their head and it hurts but you don't even realize it and it has to be some kind of balance. Something that you do or something that happens to you to balance out that thing. Maybe it's finding someone that you really care about in, in the world, not their world, but in the world or something like that. But it really is horrific to be called, to, to have your friends that you grew up with to think that you're some kind of apostate or some kind of a danger or some stupid thing or something like that. And it was really it's really hurting every time you hear it when you when you read about them. Oh, they had a assembly and this per and they call those outside the organization and talk about the organization as such and such or as such and such. So that's a direct tie from my experience. And I feel the same way as the other example that I showed you. Now, going on to your danger. They don't care. I mean, this is a ta another racist tactic. Um, like I said, it's a tactic that they use. And the, the organization of Jehovah Witnesses are taught this. Okay. They have... No, it was one term I wanted to say, but I still don't have it. But it is about your safety. And I've heard it on YouTube so many times, and it was so sad. And it's not even, it's beyond crying or getting mad or getting upset. And it happened to me, so I'll tell you about my experience. I, when I had left the Jehovah Witness, I went to my, um, I had to pick, oh, I had to pick up mail. I wanted some important mail for my house um, there where I used to live because I had to leave my, because I was staying with my mother for a little while. Just, I'm not going to go make the story that long. So when I got this, uh, when I got this fellowship, when I left the organization, my the address was still there. So I went to the door and I knocked on the door. The screen door was locked. And my sister-in-law came to the door and said to me that I'm sorry. I mean, I don't even know if she said I'm sorry. She said, you cannot come to the doorstep. That's what she said. And I grew up in the house. And she said, you cannot come to the doorstep. You're not supposed to come to the doorstep. So I left. I didn't get angry. But that's the thing that an extra witness has to face. And I don't know where they put it. I don't even know where I put it. Maybe... God helps me, or I would have to be something, but it's really, really terrible. So then after that, this is, it didn't end there. Because after that, if you know about the story of my car that's in the former videos, and I'll explain the explanation about what's going to happen now, next. So I drove maybe like a block, and this is just a whole bunch of, um, I guess they call them Colossacs or something like that. A cluster of houses, 
different neighborhoods. And um, it's not like blocks, you know, like a regular city neighborhood, because this is on the outskirts, that's very important. Maybe 10 miles outskirts from a city, okay? So these are like housing developments. So um, I drove for about a block, maybe, maybe a block or so, a block, and my car stopped. And I put up the hood to try and see what's happen happened. But, you know, I said the full explanations in another video. And it didn't start. It just died on me. As I was waiting, my stepfather came. I guess they were coming from the meeting or something. It was maybe a Tuesday night meeting. You know, a small meeting that they used to have. I don't know if they still have them. And they stopped and they saw that my car wasn't working. They stopped for a while to figure out what to do instead of just rushing to my aid with my hood up. And they knew that I wasn't, they knew that I needed help. And they sit there for a few seconds, for a little while, maybe about a minute, I could say a good minute or so. And then they went to their house. They went to the house. And they left me there. And I had to walk all the way to where, I, to the city. And that took me, it must have been, um, I can honestly say that maybe it was around like nine o'clock, eight or nine o'clock, and I didn't get into the city until about, until morning time, you know, when the sun was coming back up. But I know that God was with me. But the thing about it is they had no they did not think not one thing about where I was or what could have happened to me. So that's what I'm saying. Now, what happened to me, I can say, the only thing that I can say is close to that, what happened to me, as far as being prejudiced with people, people being prejudiced against me. One time I was in a bar, okay, I was in, um, I went to, um, it was in New York City. And there's a lot of bars in this area, but there's no people of color, hardly any. And um, I went into a bar because I wanted to, we could drink. This is a long time ago when you could drink and have a drink before work. I mean, as long as it was no big deal. So I was getting ready to go to work, so I stopped into this bar and um, had a rum and coke. I asked them for a rum and coke. And when I sat down and had the rum and coke, I noticed that the water was from the water that you wash with the glasses, okay, that you wash the glasses with, okay, and it was that was the water that he put in the glass with the ice and the alcohol, and I drank it. I drank the, the sewage water or whatever that he gave me because it was like from his washing sink. And I drank it, and then I went up to him. After I finished, I said, can I have another one? And then after that, he gave me a correct drink. He was like in shock that I drank it. I didn't know what else to do. I just did it. Maybe I prayed about it or something. And then he gave me the right, then he gave me a real rum and coke. And I went and I drank it, and I tipped him for both of them. Thank you very much. So that's the only, that those two things, one from the Je Jehovah Witnesses and one from inside this world of, 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 of prejudice, those are two things that I balance to show you that, it, that they do learn um, racist um, ta tactics. And the last one that I wanted to talk about was um, the no talking at all. So I explained what happened to me in the in a prejudice world or in the world of racism or whatever you want to call it, which has no bearing on me. I don't think anything. Like I said, it's just something that happens to people. That's the way that they were trained. Okay, you can't really even blame them. You have to blame their system. I don't know if you can blame them or whatever. But anyway, I don't. So um, that's what's accepted. You know, so anyway, I was in this time I was in Houston, Texas. It was at the rodeo 
and we were, and I was at a rodeo. I was at the rodeo with the, but I was by where they have all the rides and everything, the amusement park part. And I was doing the garbage with a friend. We both worked together, and we were dumping the garbage in a dumpster. And beside us, not too far walking distance, maybe two or three steps, there was this beautiful horse, and this guy, this lady, and this man was by the horse talking. It was a beautiful horse. It was so beautiful that I went over to the horse, and I told them, you know, that is such a beautiful horse. And my friend came over to me, and he goes, and they... I mean, I said it was a beautiful horse, and they didn't, they didn't even act like, they didn't even act like I existed. Like I never said anything. It was like, I mean, not even a flinch or anything. It was like, I wasn't even there. And my friend came up and he goes, what are you doing? I said, I was talking to them about the horse. He goes, you can't talk to them. You don't talk to them. And that's what happened. And now, as far as the Jehovah's Witnesses, their technique is the same thing. Because at one time I went back to the organization, I went in and I sat down. And my sister walked, who knows me, walked right past me. I was on the aisle seat and she walked right past me without even glimpsing or acting even like I was there. And she taught her son, little little Carl, which I love dearly, and, and he knows, and she knows, and he was taught to walk as if I wasn't even there. And that was, like I said, one people who don't understand who's been in the situation, how horrific those things are. But you can't scream, you can't get up, you can't get mad, you just have to take it, okay? To end with a good story, I want to say this. One time I was in the Catholic Church, and it was this is where I got baptized. And one of the people that was in my class, I never talked to him. His wife was there and his children, but I would see him all the time. I, I don't know, it's just certain people, like I said, you just you just like something about them. You know, you appreciate them. You don't even have to say anything. And I knew that, but I didn't say anything. I never said anything to him. Maybe I would say hi. And he would never say anything to me. But anyway, maybe it's some kind of, I don't know what it is. But it's not, it's not, it's very, it has nothing to do with anything. It's just about, um, just about maybe friendship or something like that. You know what I mean? You know, it's just certain people that, you know, you just um, click with. I just clicked, okay? So we really never talked or anything. But in time went on and on, and I would go to every meeting. I mean, every, not meeting, I'm sorry. I would go to every Mass, sometimes two Masses, okay? And I loved the Mass. And one time I stopped going. For a while I stopped going. And then I came back, and just by casual, how can I say, um, por casualidad in Spanish, but they call it um, just by, uh, not circumstance, not circumstance, um, I guess I can say by circumstance, or there's a term, um, let me see, just for no reason, I didn't even know he was there, I sat by, behind him, I didn't know it was him, okay, and I sat behind him. And um, I remember it because um, I put a hoodie on and the, the people told, and the brother, I'm not the brothers, what am I doing? And the, um, the, um, the people in the church was telling me, um, you, the usher was saying, you got to take, you can't put your, your hood on, you have to put no hats or anything, which I knew anyway, I don't know why I did it. So anyway, there was a part where we um, we got up and sang, and he turned around and he saw me, and he goes, "What happened to you?" As if like, "What happened to you? We haven't seen you in so long." It was so true and so honest and so innocent. I would I could never forget that. And he didn't even know me as well as my sister. 
And that's how I have to end this. The next one is going to be on um, uh, exclusion. How they exclude and how either exclude themselves or exclude others. Thank you very much. I appreciate everything. I appreciate you um, spending time with me. And I look forward to the next uh, YouTube. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. And I hope everybody's doing very well. Thank you. From the heart.